One of my earlier remarks was to be about skepticism. Years ago, I told a, a friend that I'd met that I'd gone to a psychop conference, and he went, ooh, ooh, you're one of those debunkers, and he said that with great scorn in his voice. And I said to him, no, there's much more to being a skeptic than that. Uh, yes, we do examine controversial claims critically and carefully. But also, and this is particularly true of um, NCAS, I think, we believe that science is cool. And the story of Michael Servetus uh, exemplifies this. Even though scientific research, medical research, was simply a, a fairly small portion of his life and not his primary focus of interest. He, in fact, made a discovery which is called the pulmonary circulation of the blood. It's not exactly that he got there first because other people were working on this issue at the same time. It's interesting to us because we value the efforts and achievements of, of great discoverers. But for himself, this was merely incidental to his day job and something which he incorporated into his theological activities, which were his true focus of interest and which got him killed at a very young age. Now, I gave a similar presentation in 2005 in this very spot. Since that time, the library has been renovated and I have grown old. <laughs> but as someone very wisely said, don't be bitter about growing old. It's a privilege denied to many. And it was specifically denied to Michael Servetus. This is a man of immense promise and immense gifts, linguistic and medical, knew many languages, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, who made a scientific discovery which was not that much of a priority for him. The way the story ends in the flames of the stake in Geneva is an abomination for skeptics and rationalists. This is the ultimate horror. This is not how things are supposed to be. He goes up in flames, his books are burned with him, and the last couple of surviving copies end up on a dusty books, bookshelf in a second-hand bookstore in Edinburgh, where they remain for several centuries. Another reason why the story is of interest to skeptics, and this is where debunking does come in to some extent, is that there are gaps in the historical record, huge gaps. And when there are gaps in the historical record, fools rush in. Thus, when you're dealing with an attempt to reconstruct the life of this, this man about whom relatively little is known for sure. You have to deal with denialists, trolls. And if you set yourself up with a Google notification account, you soon discover that there are many, many crazies out there. This is partly to do with the fact that he enjoyed and reveled in sectarian cont controversy. Um, and uh, he's been a political football uh, especially in the, in the Roman Catholic theology world, they latch upon him as someone who was more harshly treated by Protestants than by Catholics. To give you one example, 4,000 word, 4,000 page, I should say, History of the Spanish Reformers and Protestants by Menendez y Belayo, a fanatical author from the 19th century. Catholic author, uh, very militant, treats Michael Servetus with some respect and gives him an extended uh, treatment and coverage, dismissing his, his theology, but praising him for his scientific discovery. And in essence saying, it would have been better for him if he'd focused on scientific research. And there's unfortunately some truth to that. The problem is, you see, with Michael Servetus is that we skeptics are in danger of romanticizing the past, too. It's very easy to look at this man and his life's work and to think of him as a battling rationalist fighting against the forces of theocratic darkness. But this is not a portrayal that he would have recognized himself. 
So we are in danger of engaging in anachronistic behavior and making anachronistic assumptions. Also, this is a, a self-destructive individual, a risk taker. Much of the time he took calculated risks. And he combined that risk-taking rash behavior with a well-refined instinct for self-preservation, which for most of the time served him rather well. But knowing the story as we do, we know that it's all going to end badly. So from the vantage point of a 20th century reader, 21st century reader, you're looking at him and if you could go back in time and talk to him, you'd say, no, no, no. No, no, Michael, don't, don't talk with that man over there. Don't go anywhere near him. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't go there, please. No, ah! But he does. He does. There's a lot of unnecessary drama there. So his life is in many ways something of a disappointment for the reader. Another problem, where are the materials to read, to read up on this life? Not many good biographies. There's one from the Victorian era, which is largely largely fantasy. Good one by Bainton, the Reformation historian from the 1930s. But all people who write about Servetus end up recycling the same material. There are certain memes and certain factoids which you see over and over again. Just to give one example, you'll see books which say that he practiced medicine in Vienna. Well, no. No, he practiced medicine in Vienna with an E at the end. That's a town in France near Lyon. It's not Vienna, different country. I saw that in a well-respected book on the history of medicine. These are everywhere. What you can do, on the other hand, if you're completely new to the subject, is look for memorials. Because for both Michael Servetus and William Tyndale, the first published translator of the Bible, there are statues, there are paintings. So a complete newcomer to the field may stumble upon a statue of Michael Servetus. Uh, there was uh, a recent example of the uh, Extinction Rebellion protests in England where the protesters draped the William Tyndale Memorial in Gloucestershire with, uh, with rags. And yesterday they uh, made another protest and began a march in London by the embankment where there is yet another memorial. This is how I came across Servetus as well. The International Museum for Surgical Science. They have a room de devoted to Spanish scientific and medical pioneers. And this is how I personally came across Michael Servetus. But there was no information in the room. There was just this picture. So when I saw it for the first time, I said, what's going on here? Who is this man? Why is he being so cruelly executed? And it was cruel. He remained alive in the flames for half an hour. Well, if you look at this picture, there's a woman there to the left who has a book in her arms and she's running away from the flames. Down at the bottom, you will see a statue that has been smashed to pieces. The woman, as it turns out, is wisdom who is running away from the flames, trying to salvage a couple of copies, the only surviving copies of Michael Servetus's book in which he discussed the pulmonary circulation of the blood. On the ground is knowledge shattered, destroyed by the barbarism of the, of the theocratic regime in Gen Geneva under the leadership of John Calvin, uh, who pursued a vendetta against Michael Servetus that led to his cruel death in the flames. Quick outline of his life, very crudely and arbitrarily subdivided into decades. First two decades, um, his birth in Spain. The, the 1510s in Spain are interesting for a brief period of humanistic scholarship represented by um, a trilingual Bible called the Complutense in Polyglot. Uh, in, in, in Latin and, and, and Greek. Um, and I think uh, Hebrew, uh, this, is, um, this is the world in which he was educated. He received a legal, legal training very young, in his teens, and he developed a lifelong interest in the creation of books and books as an art form. Uh, the early 30s, he, he leaves uh, the service of 
Cardinal Quintana, after becoming disgusted with certain things that he had witnessed on a mission to Rome and Bologna. And Michael Servetus begins doing a kind of grand tour of Europe. He gets himself noticed in Switzerland. And what's a bright young person to do to get himself noticed in that era? Well, one thing that he was very good at his whole life was picking quarrels, picking quarrels with eminent men. And it certainly got him noticed very, very soon. Got him killed at the end. He publishes his first book on the errors of the Trinity. We're not going to go into theology here. Safe to say that to write a heretical or what was perceived to be a heretical book at that time was a very dangerous course of action. And he was told, get out of here or trouble will befall you. And he did, establishing a pattern that was to recur throughout his life, showing his ability to say something foolhardy and dangerous, but to get away at just the right moment. Medical training in Paris, um, studying alongside uh, Andreas Vesalius, who in 1543 would publish a major text on anatomy. It's obviously a time of great intellectual ferment. Um, there is a sense of possibilities. Things are happening. But also, it's a time of great danger for anyone expressing unusual opinions. And we hear, hear tales of, of feuds and brawls and duels. But no, he gets out alive. The important thing to bear in mind about the use of dissection in anatomy classes, because I'm not going to go into a discussion of medicine here because that's beyond my, beyond my brief. Dissection did not result in an immediate transformation of ideas or an immediate abandonment of medieval attitudes towards, towards, towards disease. It was a very, very slow process. Things didn't happen overnight. And even people who were on the cutting edge of reform sometimes had trouble abandoning Galenistic conceptions of medicine. Back here um, in our uh, early, early di uh, discussion of Michael Servetus's early life, an important point to mention is that Michael Servetus wants to engage in a debate with the biggest honcho of the time, John Calvin. And so they begin a long and very nasty and very protracted epistolary correspondence in which they are constantly butting heads and agreeing on nothing. And Calvin takes an immediate dislike to this young whippersnapper whom he doesn't know. They didn't appear to have met in the 1930s and decides, well, one day I'm going to get this guy. Michael Servetus, even though it is a family name, it becomes for Michael Servetus more of a pen name because when he's in France, he adopts a French name, Michel de Villeneuve. It's a French name with some Spanish characteristics referring back to our origins in, in Villanueva. But he continues to write as Michael Servetus, and this becomes like a, a, almost like a pen name. But making the connection between Michael Servetus, the theologian, and Michel de Villeneuve, the medical student and later doctor, isn't something that happens right away. But as I mentioned, he's fascinated by books and begins to write his own books, not all on, not all on theology. Um, there is one on syrups, uh, decoctions, and he dabbles in astrology too, perhaps takes his own horoscope. This gets him into trouble because he's uh, walking on very shaky ground. Uh, he's expressing quasi-heretical views. And pretty soon, the time will arrive when he needs to pick up sticks and move somewhere else. A period of professional success in the 1540s. And this is an anomalous time in Michael Servetus's life because there is a relative lack of disputation and controversy. It's a period of what we would recognize as calm, middle-class, professional success. I mentioned earlier that we mustn't regard Michael Servetus as someone who'd like, abandoned Christianity. Not at all. He was a devout Christian. And he developed a very close friendship with the Archbishop of Vienne, or Vienna, remember, Vienne, near Lyon, and became 
um, his personal physician. And one of the things that comes up in the materials is that he was, Michael Servetus was a man who cures patients other doctors can't. Always, I think, hinting at some kind of esoteric knowledge. But the dialogue with Calvin continues. Unreadable letters, these. Unreadable. And that was what he was most enthusiastic about. The medicine is a day job. Theology is what really compels him, is what he finds all-consuming. Also during this period, he begins drafting a book which is a personal manifesto, the Christianismi Restitutio, the Restoration of Christianity. Uh, early drafts, there's some debate about when the section on the pulmonary circulation of the blood was inserted, but th that's the book that will include this revelation that's so fascinating for us and probably not that interesting for him from a strictly scientific point of view. No record whatsoever of any family life. Uh, there's a lady's interested in marriage and he rebuffs her. He goes around saying that he, people begin asking why he isn't married. And this is a question that will dog him. Why aren't you married? He says that he suffered a rupture. Later on, we'll find that uh, there is great, a great deal of interest in his final trial in his genital, genital region and in his reproductive health. Also, he enjoys writing about ethnic differences. It's a book on geography, and he quotes here in a very politically incorrect manner. This is Michael Servetus writing, the Scots are prone to vengeance, ferocious, well-built, but negligent of their persons, envious and contemptuous. The Scots revel in lies and do not seek peace like the English. The Irish are inhospitable. Inhospitable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he says. The Irish are inhospitable, uncouth, cruel, and more addicted to hunting than games than to agriculture. Best of all, the English have a language, difficult because of its diverse origins to pronounce. They have recently fallen away from the Church of Rome. And indeed they had. Another thing that happens in 1549, again, we're in Vienne, not too far from Lyon, period of placid professional tranquility, Michael Servetus files for naturalization. And this is a further sign that he's become completely integrated into French society. Many, many forms to fill out, some things never change, big, big processing fees to pay, and the papers go to Paris where he had gotten into trouble with the law for heretical views 10 years previously. But for him to send in his dossier to Paris is his way of saying, well, I'm here, no one, it's fine, the coast is clear, I'm safe. And clearly he had been forgiven. The young whippersnapper had arrived and he was accepted as a well-established member of society and a productive one. He's working on Bibles in the evening, translations, poetry, using his men, gifts in many languages, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, to write uh, well-annotated Bibles. Well-annotated books, I'm sorry. Relations deteriorate with, with Calvin deteriorate further. Now, Michael Servetus has been very good at, at covering his tracks and making sure that uh, He's always one step ahead of trouble. But in establishing good relations with printers and publishers, not just in, in Lyon, but in, in other cities as well, he, he set a trap for himself because some of those publishers also had relations with Calvin. Calvin being another person who was deeply interested in books, book technology, and the use of books to spread the word. So trouble is brewing here, and it's about to blow up in Michael Servetus' face. Restitution of Christianity is published. A copy is sent to Calvin, sort of to rub his nose in it. Um, but Calvin is now pretty soon able to make the connection between Michel de Villeneuve, the doctor by day, and Michael Servetus, who is out there somewhere. And so the two lenses sort of 
click into focus. He reports back to the ecclesiastical authorities in Lyon. Michael Servetus is arrested and he's thrown in jail and he's burned in effigy. But still retaining that almost magical ability to stay one step ahead of the sheriff, he just walks out of jail. He just escapes. And apparently he found that he had a stash of money nearby, well buried, for just such a contingency. And so he escapes into the night with his money and vanishes for several months. Now, you'd think, if he had any sense, that he would move somewhere else, not to Geneva where his great enemy Calvin is, probably not back to Paris, and indeed later he did say that he had contemplated going to join the Protestant community in Sicily. But foolishly for him, very, very foolishly, he shows up in Geneva where his great enemy John Calvin is. Now, some historians think that it's perfectly natural that Michael Servetus would go to Geneva, but I th still think it's strange. Everything that you can imagine that could go wrong did go wrong. There, was, there were technically, technically legal charges against him, anti-Trinitarianism, that's the denial of the Holy Trinity, and opposition to infant baptism. And, Technically speaking, you could say that he was guilty of these two points of view because he had written on these very subjects. But ultimately, Calvin's enemy had fallen into his clutches and Calvin wasn't about to let him get away. Servetus was not inconspicuous when he arrived in Geneva. He was encrusted with jewels. He had a gold choker around his neck. One thing you didn't do at that time in history was to walk along medieval roads and highways with a gold choker around your neck because some bandit or highwayman would go, Whoa. anyway, he arrives, he, his jewel, jewelry is confiscated and he's thrown in jail. I think uh, a former a, a, a professor at Oxford who wrote a, about the Inquisition uh, has said a sentence which has always stayed in my mind. People in this era did really believed and did not merely profess to believe that what they did in this lifetime would affect their prospects for salvation. And I think Michael Servetus really believed that he couldn't evade Calvin any longer, that they were bound to have a confrontation. Servetus always believed in his powers of persuasion and possibly thought he could win Calvin over, but that was never going to happen. Also, some other possibilities, the, the, taking rash decisions. <coughs> Did he have an undiagnosed illness, perhaps, that caused him to act impulsively? We just don't know. We just don't know. One other explanation that has been offered was that in the period of time that he was interested in astrology, he took his own... Uh, he took his own horoscope and concluded that he would have to have a reunion with a confrontation, face-to-face -face confrontation with Calvin one day. But it resulted in his death and he appears not to have considered the possibility that he would be burned at the stake because when the sentence was pronounced, he screamed and screamed and screamed, begged for mercy, begged to be beheaded, the shorter, quicker execution. But no, 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 he was, uh, he, was, uh, he was burned at the stake in Champel, a suburb of Geneva. This is the um, monument. And remember how I was telling you earlier that even if there are relatively few biographies and a lot of bad information on the web, there are statues and paintings. This is the very spot where he was executed on Avenue Michel Servet, very appropriate, in front of a hospital. And I think it's very appropriate that uh, the avenue behind him should be named after a doctor. This is the, um, I found this from one of the, one of the uh, texts on, biographical texts on Michael Cervantes. I don't think it's a very good translation. But these are the three paragraphs that he devotes to the subject of the pulmonary 
circulation of the blood, and I'm not going to get into the medical aspect because there are people who know more than I do. The main thing to take away about this was that this was a means to an end. He wasn't interested in the scientific discovery for its own sake. He wanted to explain how he believed the soul entered the body, and this was part of his theology. For a man whose roots were in, in the late antiquity, uh, an observation, a scientific observation, didn't really mean anything unless there was some purpose to that phenomenon that you were describing, and he was concerned about the spiritual Im implications. So he's interested in the whole concept of ensoulment. And we, as modern-day rationalists and skeptics, look at this and we cry because we wish there'd been more of this. But what survives is this. Another um, thing I want to switch to briefly here is uh, we're talking about the fact that Michael Servetus uh, has been rather overlooked by history. But not all his uh, scientific pioneers have been so overlooked. And I just want to talk a little bit about the better known William Harvey. Um, here's a pop sci book from the Wellcome Institute in London. It's well worth a visit uh, if you go over to London. And um, you ask people in school uh, who, who discovered the circulation of the blood. And they, may, they may actually know the name. They won't know Michael Servetus, but they'll know the name. And here's this contemporary biography I picked up. No mention of Servetus. Why? Because Harvey didn't know about Servetus because his books had been burned. So as an analytical tool, compare and contrast, it's interesting to look at how their lives played out and the differences and similarities between the two of them. Um, and as you look over the key points, the highlights of their lives, it's a, the inescapable conclusion is what a difference the passage of a century makes. Both of them had continental education. Harvey was educated in Padua, uh, Michel Servet at the, at the Sorbonne, and lots and lots of hard work, very rigorous academic requirements, and a very unpleasant student life involving great hostility among the different ethnic groups of students from all over Europe, uh, with the result that there were uh, brawls, duels, fistfights, not, not, a, not a congenial atmosphere, not a lot of peace, love, and understanding. Friends in high places, yes. Harvey was friends with the top, King Charles I. Then he got into trouble later when King Charles I was deposed. Single-mindedness, definitely. Continuing interest in medication, that's interesting because Harvey dissected all his life. He dissected, dissected, dissected any creature you imagine, birds, but also cats and dogs, and even in that a robust age, Harvey's interest in dissection of cats and dogs was beginning to raise a certain amount of disquiet. What else? Um, involvement in professional organizations. Well, Harvey is in interested in professionalization, establishing regulations, the use of the prescription pad, regulations for doctors to follow. And with Servetus, no, there's not much of that. There's evidence in 1549 that Michael Servetus served on the panel uh, to administer exams to a, uh, a pharmacist. And we also know that Michael Servetus did pro bono work in the 1540s, which uh, Harvey never did. Harvey always charged. But uh, violent death, well, we know what happened to Servetus and William Harvey didn't die a violent death. He died in his bed. It wasn't a pleasant death, but it was not a violent death. The main thing that's of interest to skeptics, though, is to contrast the, the way they interacted with people who didn't like them, their adversaries. And I just want to quote from the Harvey biography, and this is of interest to skeptics. This is Harvey talking to adversaries, people in the profession who did not believe him. And listen to these words and think how you have interacted with disbelievers or believers over, over the years. Harvey attempted to disarm his opponents with the assurance that it would not be a base or shameful thing to change their opinions or to desert their errors. 
however ancient those erroneous opinions might be. For true philosophers, he said, do not suffer themselves to be addicted to the slavery of any man's precepts, nor do they swear allegiance to mistress antiquity so openly to leave their friend truth. As a variation on this theme, Harvey appealed to his adversary's sense of history. You were not so narrow-spirited, he told them, to believe that an art or science is so absolutely and perfectly taught in all points that there is nothing remaining to the diligence and industry of modern men. So he's facing a tremendous challenge. He's encountering, encountering resistance. But eventually he'll win. Compare, compare and contrast to Michael Servetus's <laughs> dialogue with his enemies. And there is no dialogue in this case. It's a dialogue of the deaf. Everyone is talking past each other. I give you the words of Guillaume Farrell, John Calvin's assistant, who delivered the last words to Michael Servetus before he was about to burn to death in the flames. And here, Farrell is talking to the audience of rubberneckers and onlookers as well. Pointing at Servetus, you see what great power Satan holds over the souls of those of whom Satan takes possession. This man, Servetus, whom you observe standing here, is a wise man, and he thought he believed he was teaching the truth. But Servetus fell into the clutches of Satan, and Satan shall never release him. Take care that something similar does not happen to you. And then the flames were lit. This is a um, translation into English of uh, some of Michael Servetus's theology uh, from the Restoration of Christianity, his personal manifesto from 1553. Christ fills all things. He descends to the lowest depths and ascends to the loftiest heights and fills all things. He walks upon the wings of the wind, rides upon the air, and inhabits the places of angels. He sits upon the circle of the earth and measures the heavens with his span, and the waters in the hollow of his hand. Now Christ walks among the candlesticks, that is, in the midst of the churches, as the apocalypse plainly teaches. His place is not in any particular heaven, as some think. He dwells above all heavens and within us. This has been described as a kind of pantheism by Michael Servetus' critics. Moving right along here, how did Michael Servetus resemble other Reformation heretics and reformers? Well, the main thing to point out uh, is that if you travel in that time, the time of William Tyndale, the time of Michael Servetus, if you traveled about a lot, and most people didn't, and if you had an interest in languages, this was considered to be fishy. One other point that I forgot to mention about Michael Servetus at his uh, trial for heresy and blasphemy in Geneva was that the prosecutors were intensely interested in not so much his theology, although that came up, but the, the question that kept coming up again and again was the interest in his sexuality, his genital area. There was something wrong down there, botched surgery, were they referring to uh, the, the undescended testicles? They kept asking him, why didn't you marry? Why did you never get married? And you can see what they're driving at. Also, they were asking him, are you Jewish? And Michael Servetus, a lawyer, remember, trained lawyer, would respond by saying, my father wasn't. But this was a, a kind of a legal response because, well, his mother was. She was a member of what they called a converso family, Jewish families that had been given the option of converting to Catholicism and who privately and at great risk to themselves uh, retained Jewish customs. Strong focus on the Bible rather than church decisions, solitary disposition, jailhouse letters. Both Tyndale and Servetus wrote jailhouse letters begging for books and cleaner, uh, th thicker clothes. Both suffer the agonies of the cold in jail 
in, in Geneva it can be pretty cold and damp. And um, uh, Tyndale, who was in Vilford in Brussels, had the same experience. They, they had ragged clothes full of holes and they begged, begged for uh, clean linen. And yet, just to re reinforce what I mentioned earlier, it is very dangerous to take an anachronistic view towards Michael Servetus and to consider him as someone who was fighting the good fight against theocratic darkness, because this is not a portrait that he, of himself that he would have recognized. He had Catholic friends, and if he was the personal physician to Archbishop Palmier, this meant that he was a mass-going Catholic, and he would not have been chosen otherwise. He reserved his venom for his own side and had a unique capacity to freeze potential allies into postures of undying hostility. And yet, he had a mind of agile ferment and wonder, a mixed bag. Just a, a quick quote from Professor Ross that I mentioned earlier, um, a description of what burning the stake actually involved. This is an auto da fe. And um, the, to make these holocausts of human beings more ghastly, the pageant was enhanced by processions of exhumed corpses and heretics and effigy. Artificial dolls and decomposed bodies with grinning lips and moldy foreheads were hauled to the bonfire, side by side with living men, women, and children. The procession presented an artistically loathsome dissonance of red and yellow hues as it defiled to the infernal music of growled psalms and screams and moanings beneath the torrid blaze of Spanish sunlight. That's one of my favorite quotes there. All right. What happened afterwards? Servetus was reduced to ashes. His books were reduced to ashes. Well, that's a subject in and of itself. Uh, as a book that came out of, around 2004 uh, discussing what happened to the copies of the Restitutio, um, one possibly more ended up in the dusty bookshelves of a second-hand bookstore in Edinburgh. Voltaire leapt to Servetus' defense, and the Unitarian Church embraced Michael Servetus as their founder and one of their own. And if you go to, a un there is a Unitarian Church in Manhattan, which has a window devoted to Michael Servetus. I need to mention priority. Uh, who did what first, who discovered what first. It's always a very testy, very sensitive subject. Um, this book, Biography of Harvey, mentions Columbo, who was a student of Vesalius, the, uh, who wrote the text on anatomy. The scholar writing in Arabic in the 1200s, I think there's some question about exactly what he was saying. There are some translation issues. But it doesn't really matter. It's inherently interesting whoever got there first. The approach towards history reflected in the Tyndale Society Journal and in the new discoveries by my friend, the Servetus scholar, Pachi, whose, uh, whose book on Michael Servetus, this is in Spanish, which I've drawn upon heavily here, lays itself open to the criticism that this is an outdated approach to history. It's derisively referred to as the great man school of history. And I would be falling down in my duty if I didn't mention that not everyone agrees with this approach of venerating great individuals, great souls who toiled in their garrets to come up with scientific discoveries. I happen to like that approach, but it isn't universally accepted anymore. And indeed, Tyndale, um, and I mentioned Tyndale because of my connection with the Tyndale Society, is often perceived as someone who enjoyed a, a vogue during the Victorian age, when he was regarded as one of the founders of English civilization and by extension of the empire. And this is, I was mentioning the Extinction Rebellion earlier, not many people visit the Tyndale Memorial at Stinchcombe Hill in Gloucestershire, but it was in the news recently when it was draped with a cloth by the, the protesters from the Extinction Rebellion. And when I went to Champel in Geneva, when this would have been in 2001, there was no one there, it was just me. Uh, someone drove up and gave me a dirty look as if to say, what the hell are you doing here? So the memorials exist, and they're a great way to get
get started in your journey in learning more about these Reformation figures. But um, it's, it can be a sad and lonely furrow to plow. One, one a useful exception here. Can anyone here think of a, a previously unsung historical figure from the Reformation who is suddenly world famous? Wolf Hall, Thomas Cromwell. Prior to the Wolf Hall series and the Wolf Hall books, it wasn't a decent biography. Um, there were, there were, there were, there were uh, works of history, but now Diarmé McCulloch has written a decent, solid biography, and McCulloch is always interviewed alongside Hilary Mantel um, as they discuss how they have brought, rescued this man from the shadows. One last word here. Spanish uh, scholarship is better than English language scholarship. Uh, not perfect. Uh, there are lots of quarrels that go on, lots of disputes. Uh, this is the birthplace or the home place of the Michael Servetus Institute in Sihena, and they advertise themselves as the place where Michael Servetus was born. And uh, they used to have a video up on YouTube, and you could imagine uh, little Michael, little Miguel playing. Uh, you know, playing with the horses in the barn, in the mews behind the back. Unfortunately, it's not really clear that he was born there. Uh, there's another town in Spain, in Tudela, which also claims the right, uh, cl claims Michael Servetus as the hometown boy. So whom do you, whom do you believe? Uh, even in Spain, in the Spanish-speaking world, where the, the scholarship is of superior quality, uh, there, are, there are arguments and there are gaps in the historical record which they have not overcome. But concerted efforts are being made to overcome these gaps and at last to do justice to this remarkable man. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.